Good evening. Tonight we bring you the third programme in our series on the development of New Zealand landscape painting. But we begin with a profile of NZSO concertmaster Isidore Saslav. Two years ago, the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra embarked on a headhunting exercise. Its full-time concertmaster, Peter Schaefer, had resigned after eight years in the job, and the search for a replacement began, a long and difficult exercise, as it turned out. There were more than a hundred applicants, and from these, a number were selected to spend time playing with the orchestra as acting leader in that hot seat at the front desk of the first violins. By July last year, the decision had been made. A new concertmaster from overseas was to join the orchestra. Alison Power went to meet the man who possesses the unusual combination of skills needed to lead a country's top orchestra. One always is asked, what does the concertmaster do? I mean, and uh, this is the inevitable question. And uh, I studied, you know, with uh, some very famous concertmasters. And once uh, the wife of one of these gentlemen got a little bit, had been asked that question for the umpteenth time and she was a bit of a wag and uh, so she explained that the uh, concertmaster is the person who if anyone in the orchestra gets sick why the concertmaster takes that person's place you know whether it be a trombone or a flute or whatever instrument why the concertmaster just steps right in and this answer seemed to quite satisfy the person who asked the question she seemed very enlightened about it a pre-concert warm-up for dr isidore saslav since the end of last year, concertmaster with the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. He first held a violin at seven. At 17, he was the youngest member of the Detroit Symphony and later performed with the Casals Festival Orchestra in Puerto Rico. He was most recently concertmaster for the Washington Opera, a position he also held with three other major American orchestras, the Buffalo Philharmonic and the Minnesota and Baltimore Symphonies. An accomplished solo and chamber music performer, Isidore Saslav has defined clearly what he sees as the function of his orchestral work. The concertmaster's basic function is to uh, lead the string section, to organize it and discipline it and uh, make sure everything is in proper order, and uh, then to uh, help that uh, unified approach to help the conductor achieve what he's trying to achieve. Sort of act as a uh, go-between between the conductor and the men of the orchestra. I think the first prerequisite for a good concertmaster is he's got to be a good violin player. I mean, that's a prerequisite. Um, also, he's got to be something of a diplomat in that he is often the, the fall guy between the conductor and, and the players. His personality is very important. It's um, if he is calm, if he can keep his cool, it's actually marvellous because obviously things don't, can go out of hand with so many people. Uh, Mr. Instance are temperamental. I think, well, everybody is temperamental and this can happen. Uh, things can get out of hand. Well, I think he can control the situation. You have to have the musical skill, but for a concertmaster, on top of that, a, a special talent of uh, communica co communication. Taking exact before that is a secret. There are some, very few ones, who feel it. Who feel it before before it has to be. That is the secret. We do not. We have a lot of we, our profession is full of mystery. No, but this is the ideal concert master. What sort of personality do you think a good concert master has? Well, he should be um, uh, equable in temperament. <laughs> he has a lot of uh, factors to juggle and uh, put to right without getting too excited himself. <laughs> he was always facing two ways, once to the management and the conductor, the other toward the members of the orchestra. So uh, he has to balance all kinds of considerations all the time. Because you're dealing with quite highly strung, creative people all the time, aren't you? I'd be the first not to deny that. <laughs> Are you an even-tempered man? I consider myself one, yes. That may have been one of the uh, advantages uh, which I had when I applied for the job here. I think they were looking for someone like that. <laughs> Is it difficult, as you say, facing in two directions at once? Oh, yes. It's... Uh, 
have to be very diplomatic. And as I say, uh, evaluate uh, everyone's concerns. And everyone has a different concern. The men are concerned with artistic matters and working conditions and so on. And, uh, the conductor is uh, interested in getting his way and uh, the management is worried about money all the time. You know, that's true everywhere. And, <laughs> to save it whenever they can, you know, so all these considerations are constantly being uh, juggled. <laughs> Dr. Suslov describes his musical taste as middle of the road. He likes jazz, as well as Beethoven, Mendelssohn and Brahms. But he takes greatest pleasure in the music of Joseph Haydn. I love it. It's uh, so subtle and yet so full of emotion and meaning and... Uh, insight uh, and yet so full of humor and wit that was what really made him famous yeah mm, well at least in, the, in that part no? okay upbeat with uh 29 29 with upbeat and uh, people often speak of the classical period as being pure nothing could be further from the truth it's the most eclectic period of mixed styles as possible Haydn's Symphony No. 88, in rehearsal with conductor Franz Paul Decker. One, two. It's not only Haydn's orchestral music which intrigues Dr. Saslav. The composer's string quartets hold special interest too. An internationally recognized Haydn scholar, he's published editions of the quartets, which he helped to edit. He's now working on further editions, analyzing original manuscripts to find Haydn's real intentions. So it's really detective work. It's very exciting. And my goal in doing all this is to try to uh, again, establish the uh, practices uh, of the 18th century and of the Haydn in particular as to what he really intended, what he really meant, and how he wanted his music to sound. Uh, the 19th century tended to uh, blur a lot of the stylistic practices and change them all around to suit itself. And uh, it's only now, in recent times, that uh, we've gone back to try to get back to the authentic ways of doing things. <laughs> lecture demonstration of Haydn's music, performed for students. One of the problems of playing Haydn is that the instruments we use are not really quite the same that were in use in his time, especially the bow, so that when you attempt to bring out these special accents and uh, articulations, they sound too exaggerated, and uh, it just doesn't sound quite right. So most of the time we're in a process of toning down. And you know, and another thing, the orchestras were not quite as large as we have them. The instruments were not quite as powerful so that the impulses that each individual put into the music uh, could be put in a lot more, you know, because what came out was not quite as much as we do nowadays for each individual. So it's this kind of a smoothing process we have to go through to try to translate Haydn into modern instruments. is not Isidore Suslov's only obsession. For all his adult life, the work of George Bernard Shaw has been a magnet. Dr. Suslov has his own extensive Shaw collection, and his search for work by and about the writer continues. As in all kinds of collecting, uh, one tries to create relationships and uh, expand on certain topics, try to get sets of things that go together. And with Shaw, apart from the obvious fact that I love his works and love to read them and read about him and uh, collect Shaw, is to really set off on an infinite journey because there's absolutely no end to it. I think Shaw must have been the most prolific writer ever lived. Ah, what I said in New Zealand by Shaw. I've been looking for this for a long time. He uh, lived such a long time. He wrote so much. In the bibliography of his works, uh, just his contributions to periodicals and newspapers runs to 4,000 items alone. Never mind the books and the plays. 
Dr. Suslov has already had the joy of discovering work for his Shaw collection here in New Zealand. He had one and a half thousand volumes before leaving America. When he visited here initially in April last year, he sent six boxes of books back to the States, only to ship them back across the Pacific after his appointment as concertmaster. Shaw was probably the greatest music critic who ever lived, and a lot of his observations on music I often take to heart. Shaw said, the law of traditional performances is do what was done last time. The law of all living and fruitful performances is obey the innermost impulse which the music gives and obey it to the most exhaustive satisfaction. <laughs> Orchestral players work with many conductors and soloists in a professional lifetime. Also, bar 45, the D sharps need to be raised up. <coughs> Isidor Suslov has performed with musical heroes, Rubinstein, Menuhin, Bernstein and Copland. And while all great musicians leave their impression, for Suslov there's one who stands out. I've worked with dozens of conductors, and I think, to my mind, the greatest of them all is a man who really, reputation was not really made as a conductor, but, uh, and that was uh, Pablo Casals. I worked with Casals as a conductor at the Casals Festival Orchestra in Puerto Rico for 13 seasons. And I think it was from Casals as a conductor that I really learned the most that I've learned about musical expression and individuality and forcefulness of assertion. Sals was unique. What was it about him? Well, uh, he had a great forcefulness of personality. And as he said to us many times, the great thing in music was variety. And the, the line of music should never get stuck in a rut of, of evenness because music has to grow and it has to decline. It has to go up, it has to go down. And it's the only way it can express anything that's of interest to anybody. And I always felt that Casals was a living example of the way 19th century music ought to be performed. In this season with the NZSO, concertmaster Saslav is working with conductor Franz Paul Decker. A good rapport between concertmaster and conductor is obviously important to an orchestra, but there have been cases where concertmasters have wielded unusual power. Yes. One in particular who conducted the orchestra in the Royal College of Music, George Stratton, in the 50s, uh, he was the leader of the London Symphony Orchestra and he was a very strong character with an enormous musical background and he once walked the London Symphony Orchestra off the platform at a rehearsal although he himself was not a director of the orchestra and says I refuse to allow my orchestra to be conducted by this conductor because he's simply not good enough and he then proceeded to conduct the concert himself. From my point of view the most difficult times I've had are with conductors who are string players and sometimes frustrated string players who perhaps didn't quite make it in the string playing world, now they get the chance to impose their sometimes, in my opinion, erroneous solutions on a whole body of men. So that's when the difficulty comes in. You're not a frustrated conductor, are you? Not in the least. <laughs> I've had occasion to get up and wield a stick, but uh, usually the position I'm in is the one I think is the proper one for me.
Isidore Saslav left an academic position at the John Hopkins University of Baltimore to come to New Zealand. He says one of the attractions of the job here was the physical beauty of this country and the chance to spend time enjoying it. And musically too, Dr. Saslav is enthusiastic about the place. To the position of concertmaster, the Jerusalem-born musician brings extensive experience in such work. And along with it, a determination to be part of what he sees as an exciting time in the growth of the NZSO. I would uh, like to help it continue to develop uh, along the way it's been developing, which is an excellent road. The strings are um, energetic and intelligent and alert and uh, like to do things in a unified and proper way. And uh, the other sections are fine too. They're more or less undergoing renovation. New principles are being brought in uh, constantly since I've been here. They've gotten a new first trumpet and they're going to bring in a new first trombone and a new first flute. So uh, everything is uh, developing nicely. For the orchestra he joined, Isidore Saslav is full of praise. With some additions, he believes the NZSO could fulfill its real potential. I would say it's uh, full of the equal of the middle-level uh, orchestra in the United States. Even some of the so-called upper-tier orchestras, such as the New York Philharmonic, Chicago, Cleveland, uh, I think it's really more a matter of uh, size. Recently, we performed the Mahler VI Symphony and uh, the Alpine Symphony of Strauss, in which our forces were augmented. And that size orchestra is really the size that ultimately the orchestra should be, really, permanently. And I think really all that, if, if we could, you know, get all these larger forces at an equally high level as the present forces, you'd have an orchestra which really could be, you know, the equal of any of the great orchestras, Berlin, Philharmonic, or whatever. And if you're fortunate enough to be in Wellington this coming Thursday, you'll have the opportunity to hear Isidore Saslav leading the NZSO in a performance of Verdi's Requiem. Also on the 16th of next month, Auckland's Town Hall will host a performance of Haydn's Violin Concerto in C, with Isidore Saslav as soloist.